All right, welcome back to the channel again, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all so much for coming over, man. Look at this title here. I know I'm looking like Taylor Swift. One hit wonders who deserved more fame. I'm just wondering what happened because, you know, I always try to compare sports when I see players come in the league and next thing you know, they gone. It's like, did they work hard enough? Like, what, what happened? What happened? But we're here back on the Grunge channel, man. Shout out to them. Make sure you guys check their channel out. Hey, shout out to all the good humans. Link is always in the description for those who are asking. So we ain't going to waste no more time. I want to see how many of these songs I know. And hopefully they don't play the music. <laughs> but yeah, we ain't going to waste no more time. Let's jump right into it. Not every music act can be a hit making machine like Taylor Swift. From a 60s rock group that claimed Neil Young as a member, to a Scottish band that made the bagpipes popular, these one-hit wonders deserve a second look. If you're familiar with 1979's chart-topping hit Cars, you may have figured that a And also, if you guys can comment below, because when they say one-hit wonder, are they talking about song? Are they talking about one-hit, like, album? Because I know sometimes people are on here and they have more than one hit. So, we'll see. A computer brought Gary Newman into existence for the sole purpose of creating that song. But this diminishes the legacy of the man who invented industrial music, even if Newman himself is too shy to ever make that claim. I felt lucky from the beginning. I never felt talented. I never felt special in any way at all. So whatever happened to Gary Newman? Well, the singer says that his nerves and intense stage fright are probably one reason why his career stunted. Rather than follow up cars with more hits, he chose to go small. For the last three decades, Newman has recorded and performed for his tiny but devoted fan base, who call themselves Numanoids. Numanoids. During that time, however, he's been invited to collaborate with the likes of Kanye West, Queens of the Stone Age, and Prince, wow. all of which he turned down. Whoa. By the way, that thing about inventing industrial music? We didn't say it. Trent Reznor did. This comment even led to a friendship, brief collaboration, and several performances together. The monster hit Rock Me Amadeus is so catchy that you probably forgot that the majority of the lyrics are in German. Recorded by the Austrian rapper Falco, the song was also the first by a male rap artist to hit number one in the U.S. As for Falco himself, he began his career in the early 80s when American rap was still considered a fringe fad. He penned the original version of the international hit Der Kommissar before dropping Rock Me Amadeus in 1986. Despite dying tragically in a car accident in 1998, oh. Falco is still well remembered in his native Austria. After all, he's still the country's best-selling artist ever, with ridiculous sales of around 60 million. However, his more impressive legacy is that future rap powerhouses like Eminem and Drake were all forced to follow a trail blazed by a European dude rapping about Mozart while wearing a powdered wig. <laughs> you probably remember Bismarcky's hit song, Just a Friend. No. The tune is about a guy whose lady companions all run around with other guys while insisting that- No, he had that, he had the vapors, he had- I don't consider him a one-hit wonder. And then he did a lot of beatboxing for people too. I say he had more than one for sure. They're just friends. This is a song that you can sing along with no matter how bad you can sing. But the biz transcends this borderline novelty tune for one simple reason. He's a founding member of the Juice Crew. The Juice Crew is most famous for being involved in one of the first ever beefs, known as the Bridge Wars, with Bronx Crew boogie down production. But they also bred legends like producer Marley Marl, as well as rappers Big Daddy Kane and Craig G. Yo. Just a Friend may have been the only time Biz Markie came within shouting distance of chart success, but his late 80s and early 90s albums are considered classics by fans. Right. One of them undeniably changed rap forever, for better or worse. 1991's I Need a Haircut was at the center of the court case which forced artists to clear all their samples. Sadly, Biz Markie passed away on July 16, 2021, at his home in Baltimore. He was 57. In the spring of 1983, Thomas Dolby's hit single, She Blinded Me With Science, peaked at number five on the U.S. charts. His musical mad scientist persona may have seemed like a good fit for the golden age of new wave. However, it's not a persona. Dolby really is some kind of mad scientist, and he's been finding ways to get into your e- I had to, I had to double, I, I, man, I forgot Biz Markie passed away. I had to double check. I was like, wait a minute. They wouldn't put no false information like that. Well, I totally forgot years for decades. For starters, his work has appeared in a truckload of films, TV episodes, and video games. Then there's his side career as a Silicon Valley entrepreneur. 
While working in Valley, Dolby founded a company that created part of the technology that led to the ringtone explosion of the early 2000s. Moreover, he also served as musical director for the TED conference for nearly two decades. Dolby retired from that job in 2012 to become a professor at Johns Hopkins University. Wow. On occasion, however, he'll still manage to pull out an awesome live rendition of the tune that everyone makes fun of him for. In 1990, practically every musical legend alive gathered for a tribute to Roy Orbison, the revered rocker behind 60s hits like Only the Lonely and Crying. On stage were heavyweights like George Harrison, Jeff Lynne, B.B. King, Bob Dylan, and a guy named Benny Mardonis. During the show, Mardonis took the spotlight for a solo rendition of Orbison's 1962 hit, Running Scared. Nobody in the crowd might have known who Benny was or what he was doing there, but everyone on stage sure did. Mardonis was the guy behind the monster 1980 single, Into the Night, a power ballad that's been called one of the best rock love songs of all time. The song was so good that when Mardonis threw it on his Little Herd 1989 self-titled album, it charted again. Unfortunately, Mardonis' career was derailed by the same thing that sank many promising music careers in the 80s. Lots of cocaine. He credited the birth of his child and a move to Syracuse with saving his life. In his later life, Mardonis retained a dedicated fan base in central New York. In 2000, he was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. Sadly, Betty Mardonis died from complications of the disease Man. on June 29, 2020. He was 73. Parkinson's ain't no Casual joke. fans of Outkast have heard them refer to the Dungeon family, but you oh, may not know no, what this means. Oh, not goody, Mob. They weren't no one-hit wonder. And again, they were featured on a lot of people's album too. Goody, Mob. Dang. It refers to a collective of Atlanta area artists who were all attempting to make national waves in the 1990s, yep. and Outkast was one of their premier acts. The other was Goody Mob. For a while, it was a toss up as to which of the groups would attain superstardom first. Goody Mob's idiosyncratic rapping debuted in the 1996 single Cell Therapy, a surprise hit that prompted one producer to proclaim them the next public enemy. But although their 1997 sophomore album sold reasonably well, Outkast began crushing it the following year yeah. with the release of Aquemini. Goody Mob's label was disappointed when they were unable to follow suit and subsequently dropped the group after the release of their third album, 1999's World Party. Dang. The group got back together briefly in 2013, but their reunion went mostly unnoticed. In the early 80s, when since oh, were you know what? I was, I was associating CeeLo Green with them because CeeLo Green was part of Goody Mob, but CeeLo Green went on to have like a great career but the other three yeah i, I guess so mm. 13 but their reunion went mostly unnoticed in the early 80s when synths were beginning to rule pop music harold faltermeyer was responsible for a piece of music that we guarantee is etched deep into your brain faltermeyer is the composer of the catchy synth pop instrumental axel f which was also the theme to beverly hills cop we're not going to fall for a banana in the tailpipe. <laughs> You're not going to fall for the banana in the tailpipe? <laughs> he began his career by helping electronic music pioneer Giorgio Moroder with his arrangements. Faltermeyer was then recruited for the Hollywood Machine by mega producers Don Simpson and Jerry Bruckheimer after they heard his keyboard playing on Donna Summer's hit album Bad Girls. Axel F was one of his first efforts for film, and it shocked everybody involved by becoming a massive pop hit. He would go on to contribute similarly catchy tunes to a number of 80s movies, including Fletch, The Running Man, and Tango and Cash. However, further chart toppers failed to materialize. Even Top Gun Anthem failed to make a dent in the charts. Faltermeyer ultimately took a two-decade break from Hollywood to be a family man, but returned to score Kevin Smith's 2010 film Cop Out. Harold Faltermeyer may not have the name recognition he deserves, but he can always take solace in the deep discography of awesome artists he's worked with, as well as his two Grammys. Imagine if U2 was Australian and 10 times more political. You are now picturing Australia's own Midnight Oil, one of the most awesome, politically charged rock bands of all time. With their aggressive pub rock meets hardcore punk sound and the borderline terrifying presence of lead singer Peter Garrett, the band quickly became known for its fierce live performances and firebrand politics. Even their sole U.S. hit, 1987's Beds Are Burning, was a protest song, oh, yeah. decrying the theft of lands from native Australian peoples. The Oils, as they're known in Aussie land, kept up touring and recording until their breakup in 2002. <laughs> but they've recently found a purpose to reunite. Donald Trump. Thank you. As a result, <laughs> the band launched a world tour in 2017. And if you're skeptical of the ability of an aging political rock band to enact any change, you may want to think twice before dismissing the Oils. 
During the band's hiatus, Garrett put his money where his mouth is. He ran for elected office in Australia and won, serving for a total of nine years. If you're a fan of 80s music, then there is an insanely catchy bass and synth line that pops into your head upon hearing the words, Crack That Whip. This is thanks mm. to Devo, whose 1980 single Whip It became a number 14 yeah. US hit <laughs> and garnered even more attention thanks to its jaw-droppingly mm. weird music video. It was the band's only significant hit, but this is only because Devo, the very definition of art rock, was not exactly designed for the mainstream. Art rock. Formed by Mark Mothersbaugh and Gerald Casali while still in college, the band's motif of de-evolution was expressed through their complete deconstruction of every element of pop music. Uh, the idea of de-evolution and talking about that, they just thought we were cynical and had bad, uh, attitude. bad attitude. Their robotic vocals and insane visual aesthetic confounded casual fans and critics. However, the band's artsy, technology-driven approach to their craft was also at the bleeding edge of the new wave movement. Whip It was among the first hit songs to feature a synthesizer lead. Moreover, Devo proved to be a massive influence on future critical darlings like Radiohead and LCD Sound System. Mothersbaugh went on to a sterling career as a composer for film and television, and a few lineup changes notwithstanding, Devo is still playing music to this day. The name Little Peggy March might not immediately ring any bells. However, the name of her chart-topping hit song, 1963's I Will Follow Him, certainly should. Born Margaret Batavio, the English vocalist was only 14 years old when she was signed to a recording contract with RCA. At 15, her debut album, I Wish I Were a Princess, 15. and its smash single became all the rage among her Dang. high school age peers. However, March's would-be rise to fame came at an inopportune time. In 1964, a bunch of mop-top Brits uh, calling themselves the Beatles led a takeover of the U.S. airwaves. Man. In the process, they ushered in a new age of innovation and creativity in rock that left comparatively traditional singers like March in the dust. Dang. March never had another hit record after that year, at least not in the States. As her fellow Brits invaded the country, she in turn staged an invasion of Europe, going on to record a number of successful albums in German, Spanish, Italian, and even Japanese. What? She even represented Germany in the legendary Eurovision Song Contest in 1969 and 1975. In 1985, she finally achieved another U.S. hit as the co-writer of When the Rain Begins to Fall by Jermaine Jackson and Pia Zadora. Look at Jermaine! The descriptors One Hit Wonder and Rock and Roll Hall of Famer don't often intersect. Elvin but Bishop? But then Elvin Bishop has not had the most conventional career path. As a member of the Paul Butterfield Blues Band, Bishop helped to inspire generations of rock artists to embrace the genre's bluesy roots. While the outfit didn't make the biggest impact in the Billboard charts, their impact on their fellow artists was far greater. Bishop recorded four albums with the band before relocating to the Bay Area to embark upon a solo career. It was a career that went relatively unnoticed, but for one hit song. This would be the 1976 single, Fooled Around and Fell in Love, yeah. a soulful number featuring a stellar lead vocal from singer Mickey Thomas. The tune spent a whopping 17 weeks on the Billboard chart, peaking at number three. It also became a staple. It was crazy because when I first reacted to this, I thought he was Elvin Bishop. I didn't realize he was a guy on the guitar. Full of classic rock radio and gained even more exposure when it was featured on the soundtrack to Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy in 2014. Bishop has continued to record blues records ever since, but has never again had that kind of chart success. The same, however, cannot be said for Thomas. Owing partially to the success of Bishop's lone hit, he was later invited to join Jefferson Starship. That band, which later became Starship, was responsible for some of the most universally despised massive hits of all time in We Built This City and Nothing's Gonna Stop Us Now. It would be tough to find a band name more evocative of a mystifying enigma than Question Mark and the Mysterians, nor a band more suited to the moniker than the one who took it on. From its outset, the Michigan outfit seemed determined to labor in obscurity. They took their name from an obscure Japanese sci-fi movie, and many of the fans who jammed out to their one major hit, 96 Tears, could have been forgiven for not knowing that the band was uniformly Mexican-American, an extreme rarity on the 60s rock scene. With that one song, though, the band advanced a singularly unique lo-fi fuzzy sound I'm about to that would prove to have a lot of legs. Speaking of which, famed music journalist Legs McNeil has credited the 1966 tune with being the first garage punk song. That said, it would indeed be a challenge to find an earlier example of a song hey. fitting that description. Hey. While they continued to bang their heads against the pop charts into the 70s, mainstream success stubbornly eluded them. However, the band has continued to be a steady live presence to this very day. Citing the band's status as pioneers, lead singer Question Mark even lobbied for a Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction in a 2019 interview with M Live. He told the outlet, 
Iggy Pop and the Stooges are already in there, and Bob Seger, but they're not looking at who influenced those bands. Mm. Released during the Summer of Love in 1967, Buffalo, Buffalo Springfield's For What It's Worth is instantly evocative of 60s counterculture. What? You may not know the song by its title, which isn't featured in the lyrics. However, you certainly know it by the chorus, which goes, Stop, hey, what's that sound? Everybody look what's going down. Yeah, yeah. The tune came smack in the middle of the band's extremely short run. We're new at recording. They only released three albums in two years between 1966 and hey. 1968, with its members going on to other things after its demise. But aside from that one iconic top 10 hit, it's those other things that make Buffalo Springfield noteworthy. After all, the band was nothing short of a breeding ground for amazing artists. For starters, Buffalo Springfield's guitarist and pianist was Neil Young, Neil who Young. you may have heard of. When he wasn't dropping classic albums with his band Hi, Crazy Bird. Horse, Young was teaming up with fellow former Buffalo Springfield members Stephen Stills of Crosby, Stills & Nash. Stills' folk rock outfit even occasionally tacked Young onto the end of their band name. Guitarist Richie Ferrey and bassist Jim Messina would go on to form Poco, who scored three top 20 hits. Messina would later form a partnership with singer-songwriter Kenny Loggins, who inexplicably dominated movie soundtracks in the 80s. Yeah, boy. Due to their influence on 70s album rock and the fact that pretty much all of them are legends, Buffalo Springfield was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1997. Singer Nick Lowe has a... So how did they get... What do you mean? What do you got them on the list for? Nick Lowe. Quirky way with words. In the UK, Lowe scored a top 10 hit with the amazingly titled tune, I Love the Sound of Breaking Glass. In the US, his only top hit came from his third album, 1979's Labor of Lust, which followed a pair of 1978 efforts titled Jesus of Cool and Pure Pop for Now People. That lone hit in the US was Cruel to Be Kind. The song, about a guy whose girlfriend insists that her harsh treatment of him is a sign of her undying love, peaked at number 12 on the charts. Aside from his incredible sense of humor, Lowe deserves a ton of credit for his stellar work as a composer and producer. He's notched credits for the likes of Dave Edmonds, Johnny Cash, Elvis Costello, The Pretenders, and The Damned. It may not surprise you to learn that his lone brush with pop stardom came very close to not even happening. In an interview with The Guardian, Lowe remembered his response when Columbia Records executive Greg Geller expressed interest in releasing Cruel To Be Kind as a single. According to The Guardian, Lowe recalled telling Geller, Oh yeah? You like that, Greg? Great but I've got a better song here about a woman who was eaten by her dog. Big Country <laughs> formed in 1981 what? after the demise of the Skids, a new wavy punk outfit that had some success in the UK him. in the late 70s. Frontman Stuart Adamson gave the new band a familiar face and voice, but Big Country's sound was unlike much of anything that came before it. It was genius, really. Being from Scotland, the band thought it might be interesting to take traditional instruments like fiddles and bagpipes and stick them where most of the electric guitar should be. As it turned out, they were right. Legendary producer Steve Lillywhite polished this sound to a fine luster on Big Country's debut record, 1983's The Crossing. The lead U.S. single, Fields of Fire, got some airplay and did well on MTV. However, it was the follow-up song, In a Big Country, that scored the band their only top 40 U.S. hit. Big Country's seven subsequent albums performed decently in the U.K., but the band was all but forgotten in America until Adamson sadly died by side in 2001. Uh all right, ladies and gentlemen, it was a lot on there that I didn't agree with. Um, some of them I'd never heard of before. I, I want to see the comments and see what you guys think. Uh, again, appreciate the grunge channel. I want to check out that 96 tears because I, I never heard of them before. At least I don't think I reacted. I know I got songs that have the title tears in it, but I don't think I reacted to them. Gonna have to check that out. But, hey, appreciate you guys coming over and watching, man. But, yeah, it was a lot in here that I didn't agree with. But, all right, peace out.